Well, praise Jesus, hallelujah. Here we are doing the Peterson Chronicles, Angel Wars, and the Luciferian Rebellion show number 54. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hey, man, this is exciting. Um, and the shows, I think, have been getting more exciting and better and everything. And, you know, Lauren's just been digging into some really, I think, really interesting stuff. Praise God. Um, uh, and anyway, so... Um, uh, I wanted to share this with uh, folks um, on account of that it's just kind of cool. Um, I will probably bring this uh, out also on the live radio show that we do uh, tomorrow night, Sunday night on the 31st. It will be the 31st of May. Uh, but this show will be airing, of course, a week later, since it's pre-recorded a week earlier, uh, on the 6th of June, praise Jesus, that evening. You know, God willing, uh, the way things are ramping up around the world, not only from a tectonic, geological, plate-shifting, volcanic activity standpoint, uh, but also from a... Uh, 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 you know, wars and rumors of wars standpoint, and you could even argue uh, from the as in the days of Noah standpoint, things are getting pretty creepy. Now, a lot of people are uh, excited about the stuff going on with CERN, and while I find it stupendously interesting to 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 look at, analyze, read articles on, because praise God, I do come from a science background. Um, uh, I also am keenly aware that the Father has everything ultimately under his control. Now, whether or not the Father relinquishes that control over the CERN operation uh, after the Great Tribulation begins, that's anyone's guess. The the But he's controlling it, for, absolutely. They are not going to create any black holes in CERN. They're not going to... There are not going to be... There will not be a single portal open by Lucifer leaving demons into this realm unless the Father ultimately allows it okay so we have to really kind of get our arms around the level of power and th and, that, and I didn't used to understand that I'm going to be perfectly frank with you folks I I there are some phenomenal books by some very godly men uh there's one uh written by the title of God at War um a lot of really good Christians and super theologians really brilliant ones in some cases uh came to conclusions that the war between uh what appears to be a war between Lucifer and um and the father is a tangible war uh and there's a little uh you know there is certainly evidence to indicate that um Lucifer has uh potentially some tricks up his sleeve and he actually still even to this moment in in our time space at least from our concept or our perception level that Lucifer has some you know, sneaky master plan, uh, and some people think that he might actually plan on pulling a fast punch or a fast one on the father. And there is scriptural evidence to indicate that uh, that does tend to be his modus operandi. But when we truly understand the the magnitude of the power of our omnipotent, most high, El Elyon Father, uh, God, um, then we then then and and and, and as long as you are. A you know a passionate believer in the accuracy of uh, the at least the 66 book canon to, to you know then at that point you know when you when you really when the word of God becomes who you are when you actually now when you get past the point of occasional reading of it and it starts to imbue into the very existence of your energy field. And, and, you know, maybe you want to refer to that as spirit soul matrix, okay? Maybe that, maybe you're more comfortable with that term. Uh, you know, if you look at our existence from a particle physics standpoint, it might be more uh, accurately described as a particle field or energy field that's being held together uh, in an impossible to explain miraculous manner by, um, well, the power of Jesus Christ, ultimately. So if we are living in, which there certainly is a lot of information to indicate so, a matrix of some type, a hologram that is, uh, and, and one could even argue and might be correct by doing so, that literally all existence is one form of a phenomenally amazing hologram that is ultimately being created and manipulated uh, and controlled by our heavenly Father. 
Um, all things were created by him and for him, and through him all things uh, were and are created, or by his pleasure, all things were and are created. And I, I know I didn't get that exactly right, but that's basically Revelation 4, uh, verse 11. Praise Jesus. We have to understand the magnitude of the power of our Father. Think about it. If Lucifer was all that powerful, uh, you know, and, and the Father wasn't creating him a break, uh, we wouldn't even be going through what we're going through right now. The Father would have stomped them out. There wouldn't have been a Luciferian rebellion. It, it would have been it would have been game over day one. Uh, it's a guarantee. There's no doubt about it. We you know this isn't just because I'm biased because I love the Father. It's just that all evidence indicates that beyond the shadow of a doubt. So even if you look at it from a scientific mind and you divorce yourself from any emotional connection that you have with the Lord, uh, and you just look at it you know as as objectively as you possibly can, and you you look at all of the data that you're able to collect, anecdotal, uh, written text, whatever the case may be, and you do a proper analysis of it, at the end of that analysis, the only rightful conclusion must be that the Father ultimately uh, is in control of every minute detail. And Lucifer may, uh, he, he, you know, he developed pride, he developed, uh, you know, sin was found in him at some point. No question about it. Uh, it was the will of the Father for Lucifer to have free will. It is the will of the Father for us to have free will. Uh, that that free will dynamic comes into play all throughout the Bible. Uh, and and, it, and you know why would the Father select someone such as Solomon to ultimately become one of the, one of the if not the greatest kings of Israel that ever existed? And then but knowingly in advance know that he was going to apostatize apostatize at the end of his reign, right? Uh, that doesn't, you know, what about uh, Saul, King Saul? There are so many examples throughout the scripture that make you scratch your head and say, hey, uh, gosh, why did the Lord allow that to happen? So there appears to be by design um, a little bit of entropy and free will dynamics built into all of existence, which if if I were somebody, and again, this is purely imaginary on my part, admittedly so, theoretical slash uh, 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 imaginary imaginary i'm i'm using my sanctified imagination and i'm trying to assume hey if i was somebody as powerful and amazing as our heavenly father is then wouldn't it make you know what fun think about it if you're a little kid so here's your here's your analogy you're a little kid and you're sitting on the ground in a pile of dirt right and you've got all these you know most of us who are in you know if we're over 45 years old if we're over 40 listening to this show praise Jesus if you're not you might not know about them or you might you might who knows but certainly if you're over 45 years old uh arguably over 40 you, you uh, probably have at one time been exposed to little kids playing with these bags of little green army men. Uh, they're, they're inexpensive toys. Parents would give them away liberally at Christmas time to little boys like myself, and we would play with them for hours and hours and hours. And, you know, when you discovered a BB gun later, they were a lot of fun to shoot those little green army men uh, by, you know, digging a big hill of dirt and creating yourself all kinds of forts and things. Um, that kind of stuff. But anyway, the reason I bring that up is if you're sitting there, and you know, this is your analogy, as a little kid, and you're playing with your little green army men, and you put them all around and stuff, um, you have that ultimate level of control. Okay, oh, this one got his head shot off. You bust off his head, you, you lay him on the ground, he died. Right? You can move your troops around wherever you want to move, because you were in complete, full, I don't, I don't know how else to put it. The words cannot describe, but the level of control when you are cre when when you are manipulating 100% of all the elements and attributes associated with the those army men. You can melt them with a big lighter. You can pour gasoline on them and set them in fire. You can do whatever you want to do with those little green army men. It's very granular the amount of control that you have over them. But if you didn't have the mind of a five-year-old kid playing with them, you'd become incredibly bored very fast. That's why people who are typically 45 years old and older nowadays are not as much playing with those little green army men. Although I will admit, I do have a few of them rode up along my, 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 my shelf train track. I got a train track, you know, a hobby train that goes around the, uh, the office here. And along the uh, wooden uh, shelf that holds up the train track, I put those little green army men, and sometimes I shoot them with my um, with my airsoft <laughs> pistol. <laughs> 
just for fun. But the point is, <laughs> I digress. So, but the point is this. So if you're sitting there, you got all these little green army men. Now imagine, and this concept has been captured in a few of your Disney type movies, you know, those kinds of uh, uh, movies like that, um, that have a little bit of, you know, it's magical. And, you know, and all of a sudden, all the little toy soldiers and what is the name of that one movie, uh, Toyland or something like that. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. It's a really great, great film. But um, where, where the toys come to life. Now imagine the difference in the level of excitement one would have playing with toys that actually come to life. They become sentient. They have their ability to make certain choices. There's a fluidity to that dynamic now whereby, yes, you ultimately have control. And at any moment, if you wish to, you can take your fist and smash one of those toys into the ground. Kill it. Destroy it. Grab a hammer and go, pow, the hammer of God. Boom. I've had it with you. But in the grand scheme of uh, of a God that is in control, it has not only created from the get-go to the elemental, to the most tiniest elemental level, potentially thousands of dimensions, maybe millions of dimensions. We know for sure billions of galaxies Wow. And wow, then what is that? You know, quadrillions, Googles of stars and planets just in this time space? Our Father is so unbelievably awesome and powerful that what when you realize, when you use that simplified analogy whereby, gosh, you know, I'm kind of losing interest in playing with these little green army men because, you know, I'm getting tired of trying to think of what each one of these 50 little green dudes are going to do and to, to, you know, to take my hand, move it forward, and, and move them around on this big dirt hill and to create this, this artificial reality with these little green army men. After a while the granularity of having to dork around with each and every one of them over a long period of time gets a little boring. Now imagine that on a scale that the Father is dealing with and how incredibly omnipotent and awesome he is. Multiply that across billions of galaxies, quadrillions of stars, gazillions of planets, a smorgasbord of life forms, as, as Brother Peterson puts it, and multiply that times the number of dimensions and time spaces. Now, how does someone as awesome as our Father make that interesting for him? Well, the two terms would be, and I'm, I, this is, I'm proposing this, this is a posit. The two terms that you would introduce into the equation would be entropy and um uh, uh, free will. Now, the concept of em entropy, we would need to extend the scope to capture this concept. We would need to extend the scope of the word entropy to also include concepts of change that are a result of the normal interaction of the elements amidst one. So does the Father control granularly the way that every single breed of puppy dog comes out? Or, that again, so, so consider that. You know, does he create that in the granular level? Or do the breeders, by manipulating things through their own free will, which was given to them by the Father, because it's his will that we have free will, is 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 there some you know when if I reach over and take a, a hard boiled egg sitting on the desk and I say you know what I'm going to hit that hard boiled egg and I go pow and I smash it was that my choice was that choice that I took to hit that hard boiled egg and smash it on my desk was that my choice to all was it was it Solomon's choice to develop esoteric occult relationships with a whole bunch of creepy freaky deaky women in his case. At least he stuck to the proper sex. But anyway, um, 
the point I'm making here is how much is our will versus how much is the, is the Father's direct will, how much of the Father's influence controls our behavior. You know, the Scripture says things like the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. It doesn't say the steps of all men are ordered by the Lord. Nope, doesn't say that. So we know we've got the free will dynamic. Dynamic meaning that it's potentially an unknown. We know that it's very likely that there's some type of entropy dynamic in play. And you could argue entropy, but let's just let, let entropy become – let's expand the scope of the, of the strict definition of entropy to simply mean something along the lines of, hey, I have a top in my hand. You know those little toys that kids play with? The top, you call them a top and you spin them and they spin just like you can spin a quarter on your desk? Without – the interplay between the physical scientific components of existence being having some sort of mathematical norms and predictability to them, you would not be able to say, hey, that top is going to stop spinning eventually. So you say, well, does the father control the length of time that that top spins, or were the various inter, uh, 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 physical and electromagnetic interactions on that top as a result of you spinning it in the first place, do they play themselves out against the backdrop of the physics that describes that top's existence in this time space? That's what I'm referring to when I'm talking about entropy. I'm also including within the scope of the, the concept of entropy, maybe a bad choice of words, but nevertheless, this concept of that same scientific interplay of particles uh, in this particular environment, whether it be simply electromagnetic plasma, whatever whatever the different players are, elements are in that existence, whatever holds together that God created and potentially manipulated hologram, analyze that. You know, you have to you, you, it, it, again going back to that little kid sitting in front of the the, the big pile of dirt. With all those little plastic green army men, after a while, when you're moving them around manually, each one by one by one by one, it gets boring. So wouldn't it be with a, fa with a father, with our father, with our father God being as stupendously incredible as he obviously is, wouldn't it make it so much more phenomenally interesting for him to create all of these existences and to put in the entropy on purpose, to put in the the concept of free will, to, to, to animate all those little green army men so they each one had their own personality and free will and choice. So there was some fluidity into the, you know, nevertheless, you're still looking at those little green army men. And if one of them goes in a direction you don't want them to go and you have something to say about it, you can grab them by the head and move them somewhere else. But it makes it so much more fabulously interesting when they're animated and they can go about. Remember the little, uh, 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 the little, um, um, football games that you could get it started out with football games with little uh little football plastic football players or whatever and in the earlier days probably even wooden ones uh that that you moved around with your hands and then they stuck a vibration engine into the toy so that by vibrating the 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 football field you know, toy thing, it would cause them to vibrate all around and, and potentially the little guy with the styrofoam football might actually not run the opposite direction, <laughs> but might actually go in the direction you were hoping for. And it became so interesting because now there was some semblance of free will involved. Wow made the game so much more interesting. That analog understanding of the dynamics of the universes and the existences of all of everything that God, our Father, created adds an, a fantastic 
piece to the of the puzzle of all of our existence. It answers questions all throughout the Bible. People, we as humans, take this knee-jerk reaction to try to shove God into a 12-ounce Coke can every single time because our sanctified imaginations are limited by our fear of trying to understand a concept that is simply beyond our understanding. And we are like, oh, no. They're going to hang me by a tree and set me on fire because I'm thinking outside of the box. When you look at things and you expand your understanding and you stop saying, well, you know, it, it's got to be this way. You know, uh, God uh, cannot. I've actually had a person who believed in Jesus, loved Jesus, said Jesus is Lord. Uh, what for all intents and purposes was a Christian, very smart scientific guy. And he made the argument and even did radio shows on this subject that God is not in control. Based upon things like Solomon, uh, based up you know the uh, Saul and these various different uh, you know kings that were you know the Bible says very clear that they were placed into power by the Father, chosen by the Father, but they made these colossal mistakes along the way. How could God have allowed that? How could He have chosen that individual and that person apostatized at the very end? Just doesn't make sense. Unless the Father animated it all. On purpose. Just like we can animate those vibrating football players on that little white board and grab the one that has the football in his hand and turn him around so he's running in the right way. Or grab a hammer and smash the green army man when he, you know, doesn't shoot his bazooka when he's told. It doesn't prevent that entropy from existing. It doesn't prevent that free will from having a major impact on the overall outcome of any given scene of that fantastic movie. And don't even get me going on parallel existences, because that whole concept will just – that one there will short-circuit most really smart people's minds. That's why these movies like – you know, these TV series is like Continuum and these ones that uh, deal with time travel, uh, this concept of, hey, uh, golly, if, you, if this person over here – dies in a car crash in 1987 and has the potential of causing uh, the entire world to, to disintegrate uh, 500 years later because that, you know, his great, 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 you know, uh, descendant uh, would have been the, the one to stop the, uh, you know, uh, creation of the XYZ super plasma quadrasonic weapon. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, this is some amazing stuff, folks. But that's how awesome our father is. I'll throw one at you that ought to make you think, praise Jesus. How about this? How about each one of us, all seven billion of us, are in our own existence? We just think we're having an interplay with the people around us. But each one of the people around us who we know are actually in their own existences, existing in their own realm, their own time space, with another seven billion people that don't really exist. I just think Brother Lauren is coming on the show, but it's not really Brother Lauren, because I'm in my own time space. Brother Lauren's actually in another time space that belongs uniquely to him. Hearing where I'm coming from? When you start to consider some of these possibilities, that's when you start to touch, to scratch the surface of the awesomeness of our Father. So, <laughs> two things I'm going to share with you, real quick. Got to, just got to, because I know there's people who listen to this show that don't listen to the other shows. But I, it, it's just awesome. So praise Jesus. So I've been telling people, I won't dwell on it. I'll speak. I'll speak on the uh, 31st show. I'll talk a little bit more probably about it uh, tomorrow night. Who knows? As the Lord leads. If I live that long, maybe my heart will stop be beating in this time space. Now, I've been telling people, praise Jesus, thank you, Father. And I, I've mentioned this before, but I'm, but I'm not doing it from a pride standpoint. I'm doing it from an awesome God standpoint. Because I fear God way too much, and I beseech him on my knees in tears. 
to just completely obliterate and burn away with his holy fire any existence of pride in my heart and completely keep me humble and contrite in all my interactions and fill me with his love. That is the one of the most, if not the single most paramount petition that I have before the Father every single day because it is elemental in our making it into the kingdom of heaven. Now that being said, I am awed and honored and amazed whenever, and I know Brother Kenneth is too, I know Lauren is too, all of us I think should be, when something that we did maybe five years ago or six months ago turns out to, maybe it was a guess. I remember the first time I heard about the existence of the of the testimony of Pastor Howard Storm. And how he met with Jesus and had a conversation. And Jesus showed him extraterrestrial life forms all over the universe of many, 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 many different kinds. Some of them pretty creepy looking, by the way. When I, when I heard about that, I just about I, – I was, I was in tears. I was in tears because that was the, the level of confirmation I needed to have to know that some of the things that we've been talking about and I've written articles about over the years was, were, were true. That it wasn't just some wild, off-the-cuff imagination on my part. It was perhaps led by my love for the Father and the results of that Jesus energy residing within my my own personal energy existence field, spirit, soul, body matrix. And that's a very humbling place to be. It's It falls under the category of who art man that thou art mindful of him, and then you're just super duper awed, and you love for the Father so much because you realize that he really is talking to you, that there is a connection. Because not everybody gets the big visions, and even some of them who do get the big visions and dreams, well, might make the mistake of thinking that they were from the Father when they weren't. So we all have to be careful. But here's I'll share this for what it's worth. Over the years, 420 plus articles on Tribulation Now, many things that we've talked about on the radio shows, over 500 of those at this point, we've spoken about them, in some cases in great detail. In other cases, we've done entire radio shows on the subject, but they were speculatory at best, backed up by the best understanding that we had at that moment of time uh, from Scripture, from testimonies of people who appear, to the best of our discernment, to love the Lord with all their heart, their mind, and their soul. In some cases, a lot better than (laughs) some of the church pastors that I've known over the years. God bless them. We're all at our own different places. But when you get that confirmation, when you write an article in 2009 or 2010 or where you do a radio show in 2011 and uh, you know, you're talking about well, what if this and what if that and what if God what if God did this or what if you know, you're always hoping that you're on the right track but you're never really sure so you're careful how you word it. You're hoping to edify, to excite the imagination, the sanctified imagination of the people who love the Lord so that they'll dig into the Bible and ask those same questions themselves and become excited about our Father, obsessed with our Father. That's where we need to be. That's where we need to be in our walk, awed by Jesus. The ability to instill that and incite that level of excitement and obsession into the hearts of, an, of another a heart of another believer is 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 very very important, especially in today's day and age where we're distracted by everything and anything around us. Now, I'll share this with you. This is awesome for me. It's awesome for you. You might be like, oh yeah, well, yeah, just another goofball, uh, you know patting himself on his bald spot, but that's not the case. Believe me. I'm just sharing it with you. Those who have been regular listeners of Tribulation Now's uh, radio show work know that I have publicly stated several times. Now, know that A, I follow prophecies and dreams and visions as best as I possibly can because I believe it's the only, if you know how to discern and you're able to correlate the data properly with some critical thinking skills, thank you, Jesus, then you should be able to discern and weed out the, the, the falsehoods from the consistent stories that will always come down from the throne room of God. Consistency is key. 
God doesn't speak with a forked tongue. He doesn't say he's going to recover the United States and bless them, at, at the same time speaking to other prophets saying he's about to judge them. It doesn't work like that. Now that being said, if you if you if if it's no secret that that I believe with all of my heart, I'm absolutely absolutely beyond certain that that is the only way to seek the Lord today, amidst all of the noise, falsehoods, uh, misinformation, demonic stuff, protocols of the learned elders of Lucifer, the lying media, all of the creepy stuff that's going on across the world. The only shot that you have in this noise level is to be paying as close attention to the Father as you possibly can. And when you have a reasonably trustworthy group of prophecy, dreams, and visions that you can correlate the data from and get the word directly from the throne room of God, what a mighty blessing that is. Because it's your only shot. The rest of it's purely speculatory. Any of your analysis of YouTube videos, I pet goat, all that kind of stuff, folks, forget about it. You can do it till you're blue in the face. It's not going to be fruitful. It's never going to be fruitful. You can do it. It's interesting. It's fascinating. But it comes from the underworld. Now, I still to this day believe there is some merit in, in analyzing some of the things that, are co that come out of the underworld, but keeping it on a very long rope, way in the background, and focusing as much attention as you possibly can on seeking the Lord and listening to his servants, the prophets, as we are admonished to throughout his scripture, particularly the Old Testament but several places in the new as well. Now, all that being said, especially considering, like Brother Lauren says, which is very, very true, that the, people who, that the, that the apostles and, and the people who ultimately wrote the New Testament and, and, and the disciples of the people of that time in that church existence weren't using the New Testament. They were using the Old Testament. So their behaviors were based upon what they, what, you know, the, the letters and epistles that they may or may not even have ever had a chance to see or know about if they did, which most of them probably did not, ever see any epistles. So they were all 100% dependent on, well, arguably the Septuagint and the Old Testament. And not the, not, the, not the New Testament version. I'm talking about all Torah, all Old Testament and the writings of the prophets. That means that they through the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, one of which, according to the Apostle Paul, was the gift of prophecy, was being the most important one to edify the church. They were keenly aware of that and constantly in communication with the throne room of God via that communication channel. Yes, I said the word channel. Call me a New Ager. <sighs> anyway. Praise Jesus. Now, that being said, here's what happened. I'm always wondering, you know, about getting hoodwinked and punched in the mouth because maybe one of the prophecies or one of the sources of prophetic information that I've, I've uh, uh, validated in my methodology didn't hear right or got sucker punched by the darkness. That could potentially throw off timeline-based dynamics. Um, Event-based dynamics that have no time E.g., they're not going to happen in any particular order, a tsunami. Out of the clear blue, East Coast tsunami, United States. That's an easy one to latch on to. If you don't have any time around it, it's a winner. Win, win, win. You've got 100, prophets, 100 people, prophecy, dreams, and visions over 60 years of time, and all of them say that there's going to be. And then you find it in Jeremiah 51. Bingo. Ding, 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 ding. Close, close the book. Tsunami. You take it, you put it on a post-it note, you stick it on the wall because you have a winner. However, when you get into things that are detail-oriented like timing, things like the claim of the third secret of Fatima, which is astonishingly amazing and very well may be legit, because if you apply the principle of what, how does the devil benefit by coming out and telling everybody through these little girls or whatever, how does the devil benefit at all by telling everybody that, the, that there's going to be a pole shift you know, potentially in 2017 sometime? at the centennial or 100 years into the future from when that one little girl received the third secret. Especially when you know that the Catholic Church doesn't even want the book of Revelation in there. They don't even want anybody to believe that there will ever be a, an apocalypse because their ambivalence and ignorance, praying to vicars and praying to saints, is going to send them straight to hell. 
That's exactly where the Vatican wants people to be anyway. So they, the last thing they would want to do is release the contents of the third secret of Fatima when it speaks about the book of Revelation in it and confirms it. So that makes it especially interesting to people like me who are performing an analysis over it. And when it says at the centennial point of that particular apparition or a, a, a supernatural event, the revealing of that, if you will, vision that did sometime around 2017. Now these these are the wild card prophetic events. T.D. Hale with Obama being in the office of the presidency. Well, you you know, with the United States being destroyed by nuclear fire, by nuclear war, while Obama is in the presidency. Uh-oh, what if Obama usurps the presidency through martial law and extends it indefinitely? Uh-oh, you've lost your time element. Is it 2016? Is it 2017? It starts to get foggy. Anyway, my point is as follows. I've made the argument several times that the best possible way that we can hope for slash track, watch, watch, watch for the coming of Jesus, watch for the coming of Jesus. Watch. When I say the coming of Jesus, I'm not talking about the second coming, folks. I'm talking about the rapture of the bride. But she gets taken off the earth before God's wrath. She is taken off the earth before Revelation 6, 17. So my argument was this new term called contextual imminence. This is where instead of looking at I pet goat videos and CERN speculation and all this other stuff and some weird French foreign minister coming out with a shape-shifting reptilian John Kerry making an announcement that 500 days from now uh, there's going to be some sort of a, a cl climate cataclysm that happens to line up with Yom Kippur and the Shemitah thing that John, Rabbi Con, Con, you know, Jonathan Kahn's going around telling everybody about, it's not that I don't think there's a Shemitah. It's not that I don't think that um, there's underpinnings of truth and prophetic, you know, all of this stuff plays, plays into it. No doubt about it. We see the supermoon coming up in September. We know that God's Healer 7 is, is, has been saying the acceptable year of the Lord. However, we also know that the same prophetess, Sister Barbara, came out with a word from the Lord and said, I will be making a declaration on behalf of the Lord on September 24th. So the Father talked to her. Now, if, if there's going to be a cataclysm and a meteor and six seal and all that stuff in September, then Sister Barbara isn't going to make a YouTube announcement, is she? But people don't want to think about that. People don't want to pay attention to the Sarah Manette vision. People don't want to pay attention to the Joe Brandt dream of 1937. People don't want to connect the dots because when the dots tell a story that they don't like – I'm raising my hand, by the way. Raising my hand. When the dots tell a story that they don't like, they want, want to reject it. Well, here's what happened. The other day, a couple of days ago – and I'm not exaggerating the timeline. I'm trying to keep it as accurate as I can. I was – depressed as I often get between shows and bummed out because it came I became aware that because of people being excited about the rapture which they have every reason to be excited that they don't want to hear it they don't want to hear about the timeline of events that the prophets have spoken about they don't want to hear that we're going to be here through the three days of darkness. They don't want to hear, or they would like to accelerate the events. They would like to say, okay, they're all going to happen. Uh, the Psalms 83 war, the Ezekiel 38 39, all that stuff is going to happen in the matter of two or three weeks, which, by the way, is actually possible, and that it's all going to go down by September. But then you got a wild card thrown in there, a, a triple plus prophet, prophetess by the name of Glenda Jackson, who spent her whole life had the, um, most, um, some of the most amazing supernatural experiences of anybody alive on the earth today, highly proven, comes out and says that if the church doesn't start praying more than they ever have, that, 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 that bad things are going to start happening. This is what the Lord told her, really bad things, and Obama is going to ultimately cancel the 2016 election. Hello? You can't cancel the 2016 election in, in September of 2015 because it doesn't exist. See, when these types of prophetic inconsistencies enter into the timeline equation, it really makes a person think. 
So I was feeling pretty lonely because people don't want to hear it. They want to believe that September is it. They want to believe we're leaving in September. After all, we got a super – it's the fourth of the blood moon tetrad. It's a super blood moon, and boy, oh boy, do the I pet goat and, and devil uh, YouTube videos out there point like crazy to that date. Why do you suppose that is? Apply the principle of quid bono to that dynamic. What does the devil have to gain to point every one of his occult sources directly to that date? A lot of depressed and very disappointed Christians. Arguably many who are probably part of the bride. What would the devil gain by dorking up the whole September expectation dynamic? Who does the devil probably hate in, in all of the humans on the earth, all seven plus billion of them, who does the devil probably hate the most? The bride. Praise God. So anyway, here's what happened supernaturally, and I'm going to bring on Brother Lauren here in just a second, but I want to get this out to you. This is powerful, folks. God's Healer 7 just came out with a prophecy yesterday. It wasn't Sister Barbara. It was Brother Dan. And I'm paraphrasing. Uh, I don't have it uploaded to the console yet, but I will for tomorrow night's show. But but the Lord spoke through Brother Dan and said, do not count my son's arrival by the hours. Count it by the events. Do not count my son's arrival by the hours, e.g. time. Count it by the events, the events. I kid you not, folks. Praise Jesus. So there is yet another godly confirmation, I believe, directly from the throne room of God, that the way tribulation now has been looking at the coming of Jesus for the bride is precisely the way that the Father would have us do it. Praise Jesus. When I heard that, my mouth flew open. I mean, you could have stuffed three grapefruits in my mouth as big as my mouth. I was like, whoa, what a confirmation. And most people won't understand it. I do. The Lord has been speaking through his servants, the prophets, the events that are about to come upon the earth and the order and then where the rapture and the harvest and everything fits into it. But nobody wants to pay attention. And I, for one, want to serve God as best as I possibly can. What a blessing. Praise Jesus. So anyway, I wanted to share that with you. Oh, and also, tonight, I was praying about going to Pennsylvania just this morning uh, on my knees. Um, I'm like, Father, I'm really struggling with this whole moving to Pennsylvania thing. It's not that I don't want to because I do, but, you know, if you're going to delay, um, you know, maybe, I don't know, you know, should I rush? Should I hurry? Should I hire painters? Should I spend more money? How fast do I, you know, will you please, Father God, open the pathway for me so I understand that dynamic, how how soon you want me to move to Pennsylvania. Will you help me understand that, Father? I need more communication from you on that. And in the middle of my, I was speaking it out loud on my knees in my prayer closet place, you know, and on this recliner, which I have anointed with holy oil. And I'm, I'm on my knees there praying and I'm saying, Father, I need you to, I'm in the middle of the sentence, I need you to help me. And all of a sudden my phone goes, root, 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 root. And it's a special alert, by the way. And I get this flush feeling over me. That special alert. was a special sound that I assigned to an earthquake over a 7.5 that I hardly ever hear. And sure enough, there was an 8.5. That's the peak amplitude, the peak, the peak magnitude of the earthquake. The first report is the highest magnitude measured. And then, as people say, they downgrade it. Well, in reality, what it is is it's peak versus peak average. And it averaged out to be a 7.8 at peak average. Nevertheless, an extremely powerful earthquake. When I pulled out my phone, woot, woot, I, I'm like, 8.5 earthquake off the coast of Japan? Are you connecting the dots? Isn't that awesome? That was the Lord saying to me, get a move on, homie. <laughs> 
put some fire in your sneakers there, boy. <laughs> Don't make me grab my hammer and hit you on the head like one of them Green Army soldiers. <laughs> Praise Jesus. Anyway, Brother Lorne, are you there? I'm here. <laughs> in oh, a virtual man. reality zone. Exactly. We're here in the, the holographic uh, zone in this time space. Praise Jesus. Yeah, Let's go I'm ahead not... and play the... I, I was going to go ahead and intro, intro you in with the disclaimer. Let's hit it. Okay. Opinions of our guests are not necessarily those of Tribulation Now. TribulationNow.org, TribulationNow.net, TribulationNow.com, Facebook.com, forward slash Tribulation Now. Or for that matter, ah, heck, they may not be anyone else's opinions. What? So, be a good Berean, Acts 1711, and search the scriptures daily to see if it is so. May God bless you. I said, who, who do you got there in the silo bunker hanging out with you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's all virtual anyway. You don't really exist, and I don't exist. Exactly. You're, exactly. I'm not really talking to you right now. I'm talking to the hologram yeah. that represents you. You're in another <laughs> hologram, a completely different one. <laughs> another space-time reality. <laughs> exactly. Oh, boy. Is it real or is it Memrex? That's the problem we, we face. Okay. Exactly. So all these seven billion people on the planet, they're all, uh, <clears throat> they don't exist. They're just figments of my imagination. And I'm the only person here that's in, in any kind of reality. <laughs> yeah, right. <clears throat> okay, so. Hey, um, to, to yeah. kick off the, because um, I want to step back and hand 100% of the microphone over to you, but I, but I, I did promise to read this because you sounded like you wanted to hear it, and I yeah. don't want to interrupt you once you get going. But there's a couple of paragraphs out of this book uh, entitled Montauk, The Alien Connection by Stuart Swerdlow. And, um, and let me read them really fast just to kind of spin up the, um, the uh, subject line that we were covering on the prior show, you know, in the direction that we were going. It's just a one, two, three, four uh, paragraphs. Let me just hammer this out real quick. He says on page 82 of the book, he says, I do not remember much of my stay on the planet Coombe. Evidently, he, he claims to have been taken to this other planet. I was told that my memory would return at the appropriate time. A frozen world covered in ice and snow. The sun's glare on the surface was blinding. The inhabitants lived underground. An elaborate and impenetrable defense system protected the entire planet. Once a subtropical world, Coombe was pushed out of its original orbit by war, uh, by war eons ago. So there's your Luciferian rebellion. It goes on to say, from space, it looks blue and white. The planet has no moons. A victim of the original battle between good and evil... <laughs> Can you believe it's in here? This guy doesn't even believe in Jesus. He goes on to say, A victim of the original battle between good and evil, Coombe was blown from its cradle orbit by those who created the Draco race, the reptilians who seek to dominate the galaxy and beyond. The creators of the Draco race came from another time space. Hmm. The first genesis of Lucifer. Their names denote the epitome of evil. Did you hear that? That's <laughs> amazing. This guy doesn't even know Jesus or the Father at all. He goes on to say, occupying the, occupying the same physical space as Coombe, but at a different vibratory resonance, there's your dimensional reference, uh, is a non-physical world governed by a council of nine beings known as the Awalu Council. While not the same beings referred to as the Nine in other literature, they do communicate with the Nine as well as participate in joint projects. The Nine first appeared in literature in the works of Dr. Adreja Puharich, 
uh, in his work with, quote, channelers, he came across a few individuals who claimed to be in contact with this ET group. Yuri Geller was the first to actually identify them as former physical beings who transferred their minds and soul essences into nine advanced computers. <laughs> Each wow. one of these... I know. Each one of these computers represent a different aspect of the mind of God. You know, their God, right? The nine communicate yep. with a few select individuals across the planet in an effort to upgrade the collective consciousness of humankind. The Awalu Council also governs the planet Kum in the star system Sirius, since the Syrians are really the lower vibrations of the council beings in the same way that humans are the lower vibrations of their ET selves. Now, that, you know, real quick, think about it. We are made up of spirit, soul, and body, host bodies, right? Okay. Yep. And then when we die, our spirit separates and goes either into hell. Our spirit soul matrix goes either into hell or into heaven. So, if that is an otherworldly concept, e.g. we leave the earth and we go to heaven to be with the Father, then by definition, there is some truth, as nebulously misguided as this is, yeah. there is some truth to what this guy is saying regarding humans uh, being, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, separated uh, or connected to their ET selves or their otherworldly selves. Well, we are. We have the spirit of God, which is not from the earth, breathed into us at conception, Genesis 2-7. So you can see the subtlety of, of the deception here. And he goes on to say, I was originally sent to earth by the Awalu Council, who directed the Syrians on the creation of my physical body. They told me there are nine beings on earth who are like me. Each one is directed by a member of the Council. I was shown my past and future while I was on Coombe. I was taken to a planet orbiting Sirius B that was a tropical, swampy jungle world occupied by short, stocky beings who live in huts. Extremely advanced, these creatures can astral project, get that, get that term, astral project anywhere they want to or at will. They rely on others for physical transportation off the world, but as they uh, but as they have as they have no need to go anywhere else, they rarely do so. Communicating exclusively by mind linking, there's that telep telepathy associated with the dark side. Um, and and really, we have telepathy with our Father in a sense when we speak to Him in the spiritual uh, realm. Uh, God is our Father. God is a spirit, and we worship Him in spirit and in truth. It's just the, the fallen beings versus the, the glorified beings. Praise Jesus. And, and it goes on to say, The Syrians told me of the coming Earth invasion by the Draco. Wow. So, this, so, so the Syrians told this guy, Swirlo, about the Earth invasion coming on Earth by the Draco. Folks, that is exactly what it says in the book 2 Esdras 15, uh, verse 28, where he talks about uh, the, the, the horrible vision thereof from the east, and the dragons of Arabia fly down upon the earth like the wind in their chariots. Uh, and he goes on to say, the Orion Confederation was working with the Draco, and there is a war going on right now between the Syrians and the Orions. The supreme merchants of the universe, the Syrians, actually supplied the Orion groups with weapons that are now being used against them. However, the Syrians keep the best and most powerful weapons for themselves, so they never lose. The Syrian, uh, the Syrians see Orions as bad children who play with matches. They do not seek to destroy them, but they keep them in check. They allow the humans, Orions, and the Draco to follow their own destinies. Folks, tell me this is not almost identical uh, to the creepy, weird uh, uh, caste system of government, fallen angel influence dynamic that we have on the Earth right now. They ultimately are, are collectively leading the earth into destroying itself, which, by the way, will be the will of our Heavenly Father, ultimately, and is spoken of in the book of Revelation. Anyway, I, wow. So I thought I'd, I'd throw this out there to everybody and, and, and let you comment on it, Brother Lauren. <laughs> comment on it. <laughs> wow, wow, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a big wow. Um, a lot of... You, you raised a lot of points this morning already that I would have liked to jump in, um, jump in to now. address. So I was, I was taking down some notes. Um, 
and, and you know, John, I rarely write down notes. <laughs> so when I write down notes, you know, it it, it means something. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I'm going to try to take this from the the top, um, hit on some points here. Um, <clears throat> for one thing, um, take a hammer, for example, a hammer, you know, a hammer – at one point in in uh, humanity's evolution, a hammer would have been regarded as high tech compared to using a stone. Okay, banging a, an object with a stone. Now we have this manufactured hammer that would have been considered high tech. But of course, in today's world, a hammer is considered low tech. But regardless, okay, regardless of whether it's high tech, it's all a frame of reference, right? So if you have a uh, a person who's a Satanist and and he or she they're they're building themselves a house, okay, and they're using that hammer, okay, they're using that hammer to build their house. They're using the nails, the wood from the wood from the same forest. You go to the same store and buy the wood from the same pallet that that person did. Um, minutes before and left the store, now you show up and you're buying the same same uh, lumber from the same pallet, okay? Now, if you know, if you were to have foreknowledge that a, a Lucifer, a Satanist, has just bought lumber from that pallet, are you going to go in that store and torch that remaining bundle of lumber and, and uh, get all weirded out and everything? Uh, you know, no, you're probably just going to buy the lumber and go home and build your own house. Um, or if you, you pick up a hammer from a rummage sale, okay, do you concern yourself whether uh, a Satanist has held that hammer and used to uh, bash somebody's head in? Or, you know, what, what, who's used that hammer before? Okay. Usually we don't concern ourselves with such um types of uh, possible realities we just see a hammer there at the rummage sale it's for uh, maybe 10 cents a dollar so we have need of one so we buy it okay now on the other hand if we're operating in discernment there's some of us who might pick up that okay there's a hammer there but i'm getting a bad vibe from it so i'm not going to buy it okay i've had i in the past i've collected computers okay computers and think well a computer is a computer is a computer but not necessarily it depends on who has used it before okay there have been times when i have um walked away from deals because i did not have a good vibe a good enough vibe from just those inanimate objects called computers okay so i walked away from the deal um <clears throat> so that's a possibility but what i'm trying to get at is Normally, we don't uh, concern ourselves or, you know, we, we, we go work, work for uh, Exxon Mobil Corporation, and we don't give it a second thought that maybe they're in the, uh, the boardrooms, <laughs> in the back rooms of the boardrooms, there are Luciferians worshiping Lucifer, and he's appearing to them, telling them what, what to do and how to invest and how to screw the economies of the world and everything. So, but we're, we're good Christians, and we go happily working for Exxon Mobil, okay, <laughs> that kind of thing. <clears throat> rather than operating in, in true discernment and calling them on the red carpet. Um, <clears throat> so this, what I'm alluding to is, is this matrix we live in, this matrix, that has so well concealed itself from our ability to even realize that we're in a matrix. Okay? So <clears throat> on the one hand, you can make the argument that we, we are living in the matrix or we're living in this hologram, but on the other hand, it has eternal consequences. You can't just go out here and just, uh, you know, drive your car, rev up your car at 100 miles an hour and crash through a, a restaurant and kill kill 50 people because they don't really exist. They're just figments of your imagination, and it's all just virtual reality anyway. And you'll go to prison for the rest of your life and maybe put on the um, – death row or something but it's all just virtual reality it's just a figment of your imagination so it's just like a virtual reality game like call of duty or something where you just go kill a bunch of people and just hit the reset button and start the game over okay so what what i see happening is this this um a, this drawing a, a um a connection over to reality as though it were just a holographic make-believe 
and that none of this really exists, none of this really matters, and you can just do whatever you want to do because there's no eternal consequences. That's exactly what Lucifer would want you to believe, that none of this has any eternal consequences whatsoever, so just go out there and do whatever you want to do. <laughs> okay? If you want want to gamble your your life away, you know, at pull, pulling the slots and playing um, gambling games and stuff and throwing your quarters down the rat hole and your dollars and ten thousand go to Las Vegas and plunk down ten thousand hundred thousand dollars in the big bet of the, your lifetime. Go right ahead because there's no eternal consequences. And before you know it, you're you're waking up in a pig pen like like the prodigal son did. He woke up. He spent his life savings, his inheritance. He spent it all, and he ended up in a pig pen with pigs. Okay, that's when he woke up. That's when he woke up from this illusion that everything's just an illusion, everything's just a hologram, and has no consequence. He woke up to the reality that his lifestyle that he chose did have a consequence, and he ended up in the pig pen with pigs. And if you ever grew up on a farm or been around with pigs, you know that pigs are not (laughs) nice creatures to hang around with with and certainly not to get in the pig pen with them and live like them okay it's not really what we have been called as our destinies to live with pigs in the pig pen so this prodigal son woke up now what if he would not have woken up what if he would have continued that lifestyle choice that he made his free will choice to live the way he wanted to. And he was under, let's say he he came under some kind of delusion that living in a pig pen was God's will for his life. That it was his destiny, pro or con, you know, <laughs> that it was his destiny to go from riches to rags and live amongst pigs. And that that just the way it is, you know, that was his destiny and that's his script to live. Whose script? Who wrote the script for his life? Okay? When we look at the Bible, when we understand it more fully, more more completely, we can come to what I believe is a wrongful conclusion that everything that happens in, in all of existence is God's will. So we can go to that extreme and say, well, the 60 million abortions in this country, United States of America, was God's will to happen. So praise Jesus for 60 million abortions. How ridiculous do we want to get, folks? You can go into the scriptures time and time and time again, and it grieves God's heart of this kind of behavior, this kind of reality. It grieves it so much that it brings judgment upon a nation and a people that go that direction. What do you think this prodigal son, what would have happened to him had he not woken up to his to the real reality behind the matrix of the lifestyle choice that he made. He would have continued in that. And if you know anything about pigs and hogs, they will turn against each other on a dime, especially if you happen to be, you know, pig speaking, if you happen to be a runt of the litter, the other guys will gang up on you and just bite you, bite you, bite you, and rip your tail, rip your ears, grab your your little feet and just chomp into you until you just die. That's what pigs do, okay? They gang up on the runts of the litter until they're dead. And they're vicious, they're cruel, and they wallow around in their own filth. When, When we look at the world today, what do we see? We see a world wallowing around in its own filth. Is that God's will? Are we just merely puppets on his string? Did he just create us and just stick us on a shelf? Just sit there and be good little children? and Don't say anything? Don't think anything? Don't be anything? You are my little puppets to play with? My little toy soldiers? My opinion is God created creation to be participatory. So when he brought forth you and me, it's so that we will participate in his creation. And as children of the Most High, we have an even more privileged ability to participate in the creation that the Godhead created for us. 
okay? And it's not to sit on a shelf. It's not to be a pew warmer in a church somewhere, a dead church, but to be active. And if the only way that you can be active is prayer, I remember you, you saying, I think it was you, John, that mentioned, uh, was it a lady or I think it was that God wanted her to do nothing but pray, and she just, that's all she did. From the moment she woke up to the moment she went to sleep, of course she ate and she did other things, you know, that are needful for sustenance of the human body, okay, <laughs> and paying bills and stuff. But every spare moment, she didn't watch TV, didn't watch the news, um, she just prayed, all right. The prayers of a righteous person availeth much, okay, so is that just virtual reality we're talking about, praying, okay? Or is it real reality, okay? So we're trying to get to the heart of the matter here. Is, is it reals or memorics? Do, does it really matter what we do, what we think, or is it just some big figment of imagination, some big hologram, and at the end of the day it just doesn't matter at all, okay? So this guy in the pig pen woke up. Now what if what if he had not woken up? What if... You see, he was working for somebody, right? He was working for the people who owned the pigs. And what if those people that owned the pigs knew who he, who he really was? And they knew that if he ever woke up to who he really was, that he'd want to go back to his father and to his former kingdom. So it was in their best interest, the owners of the pigs, to keep that prodigal son under the illusion that his lifestyle choice doesn't make any difference. He can believe who, whoever he wants to believe he is, but in reality, he's just the caretaker of those pigs in that pig pen. And that's all he ever will be. Okay? Do you have somebody in your life that says you're nothing but a caretaker of pigs and you're going to be in the pig pen for the rest of your life? Do you have somebody in your life that's like that telling you that? And is refusing to allow you to wake up to your true inheritance, to your true calling, to your true elder brother who went to the cross to free you, to liberate you, to be all you can be in and through Christ Jesus? Or are you going to accept a lie that you're nothing but a caretaker of pigs and lowly with the pigs and living in the pig pen of life? Okay? Now, what if he would have continued in that lifestyle choice? What what would his the owners of those pigs, if they would have convinced him that he's nothing more than a caretaker of pigs and that he has no future, no hope of anything else in life? And that would be very depressing, would it not be, folks? Again, if you know anything about pigs, would would you really want to be uh, take care of pigs for the rest of your life? not just take care of them, but end up in the pig pen with them, okay? Um, if that's how you want to live your life, that's your choice, but I think anybody in their right mind would not want to live that way for the rest of their life. It's like a job choice with a very short duration. Like, as soon as I can get another job somewhere else, I'm out of here, folks. <laughs> I have a better destiny, even in a normal, rational mind, I've got a better future ahead of me than taking care of pigs. And I'm not saying anything against pig farmers. Okay? <clears throat> because as a farmer, you're not literally, I mean, a farmer is not literally living in the pig pen with the pigs. He's taking care of the pigs, but not living with them. Okay? And this prodigal son ended up living with the pigs. Okay? And so how many of us as Christians are still living with pigs in the pig pen because we have not woken up to our true calling, our true destiny in Christ Jesus, okay? And he's more than just an ascended master, okay? So that much, you know, the other side will afford him as a good man, a good prophet, an ascended master amongst many ascended masters. Uh, but they, th that's typically where they leave it at. Jesus is more than an ascended master. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords and the ultimate creator with his heavenly Father who created all of existence. Now what has, 
what has stymied, short-circuited the church's understanding of things is staying within the confines of the traditional story of creation, not realizing that the six days of creation are in reality the six days of restoration of that which became corrupted due to the Luciferian rebellion and angel wars in the heavens. Okay, A real war with real tangible results. And as I mentioned uh, earlier episodes, this fallen one third got became consumed, became to one degree or another by an altered reality, an altered frequency. If you can imagine the original creation of multiple universes, multiple dimensions, etc., heavens, okay, with each with a smorgasbord of life forms just teeming, okay, and. <clears throat> but all harmonious to God's original intent and purpose and glory, okay? And but when the Luciferian war and the war in the heavens, the angel wars took place, up to one third and I don't know if that's a hard fast figure, one third, but I use that as an illustration. So I'm not going to be dogmatic about it. But I use that as an illustration up to one third because in the book of Revelation chapter twelve makes reference to one-third of the angels that fell with Lucifer that were thrown to the ground, that kind of thing. Okay, chapter 12. Um, <clears throat> so that became fallen. That part of the cosmos, that's part of the original creation, became fallen. And that probably, to some extent, cut, sliced through various dimensions, various universes, various smorgasbord of life forms that became impacted by that. So if we look at during World War II over here in the United States, we were not uh, adversely impacted by, directly by the war. Uh, nobody came over here and bombed our cities or, or uh, launched an invasion on our shores. Now that's about to change, folks, uh, probably very soon. And our our own lifetime is we're going to see that reality play out here on U.S. soil. But during World War II, that did not happen. So the war zone was the European theater and over there in the Pacific theater. But if we take the European theater, for example, um, there were areas that at the end of the war that were still in pristine condition. Even though it was considered enemy territory, they were still in pristine condition. Um, but there were other areas that were completely bombed out, like Dresden, for example, and other places that were just wiped off the map just reduced to rubble and a, an inferno, okay? So picture that as the fallen one-third. As as there's areas within this fallen one-third that were left in pristine condition all the way to the other extreme where you have the ultimate chaos and darkness, okay? Chaos. And and everything in between, okay? So, But within that fallen third, it's has been phase shifted from its original frequencies, its original vibrations into an alternate reality. So we are within this fallen one-third, and we are experiencing this altered reality. We are experiencing this phase shift. I will submit that we are not the side of matter. We are the side of antimatter. Our very flesh bodies are made out of antimatter. The scientists are viewing this from the wrong direction because they don't understand this fallen one-third concept. They don't understand that this fallen one-third became phase-shifted from the original creation frequencies into an altered frequencies. And, and so <clears throat> scientists typically are looking from, in the, in the quote-unquote universe, from our perspective from the antimatter perspective claiming that we are matter and the other side is antimatter when it's the reverse god's side is a side that matters and it's our side that is antimatter anti god anti christ okay so much so that god had to put it into confinement i e the sandbox analogy that you brought up john many episodes ago, to put this fallen one-third into a sandbox. And in order to prevent it from descending back into chaos and confusion and ultimate 
um, evil, even those areas that were still left in pristine condition but yet in the fallen one-third, to prevent it all from descending into chaos, God put error correction codes into 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 this fallen one-third to prevent it from going in that direction ultimately. And so these error correction codes, we can even see that in our own immune systems of our of the bodies of the original Adam and Eve that, that God created, to put that into their bodies, error correction codes, to, to be self-maintainable. And so we see that even though mankind has fallen by 90% since Adam and Eve, we still see our immune systems in operation. And even in that we're like 10% or less than where we started out with, with Adam and Eve, our bodies are still amazingly resilient if our bodies are given the correct ingredients to work with. Okay, so we see today's like the chemtrails and all the pollutions and, and uh, <clears throat> electromagnetic frequency interference from Gwen Towers and Elf Towers and uh, microwave towers and TV signals, radio signals that are bombarding us 24-7. Then we get a Fukushima radiation floating all over the world um, that are assaulting our immune systems, assaulting our frequencies that are our DNA itself resonates at a certain frequency and that frequencies are being bombarded 24/7 by by uh other frequencies to try to change us if we for those who who cannot be changed or transformed they'll be of course killed in the process and the new agers call that ascension okay <clears throat> um so we're in this this what appears to be a hologram, and in a sense, you could say it is kind of like a hologram because it's where God had to go into this fallen one third and and restore it to put certain checks and balances in place so it would not fall into complete chaos and confusion. So He restored it, and so this restoration within this fallen third, one third, we should see elements of how it was before this happened. We should see elements of the angel wars, the death and destruction, chaos, and, and ultimate evil and darkness. And we should see elements of the restoration. So we should be able, if we have the correct perspective and the correct instrumentation, we should be able to see all three of those types of elements within this fallen one-third. Just like if you were a house... You go into a house, uh, fire fire inspectors go into a house or building that has partially burned, and so they want to investigate the reasons why. So they go in, and, and uh, obviously there's parts of the house that are untouched other than the smoke, and there's parts that are totally torched and burned. And so uh, they might have to condemn the entire structure, or maybe it hasn't gotten so bad that they have to condemn it, but the owner is going to restore it, going to renovate the house. And when the renovation is done, it's going to look like nothing ever happened. You won't even be able to smell a, a whiff of smoke on the walls anymore. Okay, it, it, there, There's experts who know how to do this, experts in the, the field of restoring buildings and structures that have succumbed to fire. They know how to go in and, and fully restore these structures. Totally amazing. So if we know how to do this in the natural realm, think what our Heavenly Father knows how to do from his capabilities and his perspective to restore this fallen one-third. Okay, so when you look at at the world today, and, and, and the world today, if those of us have lived long enough, we go back 40, 50 years when, when the environment itself was more pristine, and we look at all the natural beauty in the world, and we think, wow, you know. And this is a fallen reality that God restored. Okay, and we can see how beautiful his restoration was. Think of how it what used to be before it became corrupted. Think of the unfallen two-thirds that have continued to live in their pristine worlds in the unfallen two-thirds, have continued to receive the fullness of the Godhead in their daily walks, and their daily existences, and have not succumbed to what 
what this fall and one-third has to come to. Okay, so this idea of a hologram, it's understandable to one point, but it becomes, um, in my opinion, if you take it to the extreme, it cheapens life to where life doesn't matter. You can just do whatever you want to do. There's no consequences. You can just, whatever you want to do, just go out there and do it because there's no consequences, and, and they're all figments of your imagination anyway. So um, <clears throat> good luck in a court of law making that your claim. <laughs> that will lock you away in a rubber room on death row. Okay, And if that happens, uh, that guy that did the Aurora Batman shootings, he's up on trial. That's what brought this to my mind. On trial, again, you know, uh, they're going over this, and uh, he'll be probably sentenced for life in prison. You know, on the technicality that he was insane when he did this. He may or may very well have been insane when he when he committed these atrocities. And there's evidence to, to show, to indicate that the, he was not a lone gunman, that there was others involved in this. But, you know, the federal the federal judge is not going to allow that evidence into the courtroom because that would then comp- imply a conspiracy, and then how do you go after that information? It's just much easier to pin it on one crazy lone nut, nut case. Okay, much easier, much simpler. And he'll be in a rub room. So when the, when the day uh, comes, when he finally wakens up from his delusion and he realizes fully that he really screwed up and he's in this rub room and he's on death row, then what? Okay. No matter what his appeals, no matter how sorry he is, no matter how much good that he potentially might be able to do if he were to be reformed, if he were to be released in, out into normal public, it won't matter because he'll be on death row and they'll. It's like what was it, Hinckley? Um, he's on constant watch and surveillance because of what he did. So, um, this guy in the pig pen, the prodigal son. Okay, what if he would have continued in that direction? Ultimately, he would have died. He would have died in a pig pen of life and have never woken up to who he really was and even how to get back to where he was. And that's why Jesus came into our pig pen existence to wake us up and say, there is a path out of this pig pen. Come follow me. I know where that path is. You follow me, and I'll lead you out of this pig pen and back to your father, back to your true inheritance, back to your true rightful standing with our father. But it has to be done through Jesus. Now, part of this strong delusion, there's uh, portions of this strong delusion I see that has infiltrated the church itself. Because uh, the church not waking up to the deeper truths of God's word even, okay? So, if we take the creation story as just the, as the traditional uh, creation story and leave it that way, we're not going to be prepared for what is to come upon the earth in the form of these alien beings that are coming in spaceships, and some of them have already arrived, such as the Syrians and the Pleiadians and the Arcturians and all these other various groups that are supposedly coming here to help mankind ascend to this higher awakening and the higher light frequencies. Okay, <clears throat> And they are also very much opposed to the Zetas and the uh, Dracos and reptilian shapeshifters, you know, that you mentioned before that they're at, at war with, okay? When we examine Lucifer's kingdom, <clears throat> his fallen one-third, do you think that his kingdom is 100% unified? Jesus said that a kingdom divided, house divided cannot stand. He was making a, an obvious assertion, an obvious truth to Lucifer's kingdom. That Lucifer's kingdom in the end cannot stand because even Lucifer himself is divided within himself as the Lucifer slash Satan enigma, two personas of the same person. So even Lucifer's kingdom, by definition of Lucifer Satan himself, 
will not stand the test of time. It's unsupportable. It, it It's just he's at war with himself. When he walked away from the Godhead and fomented this rebellion and this war in the heavens, he ultimately went to war against himself. And so he cannot stand, in the end, final analysis. But until that time, these nine, uh, this Council of Nine that you made mention, uh, reference to, there may be other Councils of Nine, but the Council of Nine that we're familiar with is the ultimate Council of Nine directly through the nine stones of Lucifer's breastplate as reflected, as mentioned in Ezekiel 28, verse 13. The nine stones, nine tribes of angelics, each tribe headed, overseen, lorded over by the the top um, being known as the Council of Nine. Okay, so <clears throat> there's in Maya, Mayan religion, there's uh, nine heavens below and 13 above. Okay, so these nine heavens below, to me, corresponds with this, these nine stones, nine stones, nine tribes, nine heavens. Okay, so on the lower uh, realm, lower rungs of this, we get into the lower frequencies and the lower beings like the Zeta Grays and the uh, Dracos and reptilian shape-shifting freaks. They're on the lower frequencies. So the higher up, the higher up in in this uh, these nine heavens you go, the more light and enlightenment you receive. Okay, and so when you're at the higher realms, you look down at the lower realms and you say, oh, you know, nobody would ever miss if we ever got rid of those grays and reptilian shape-shifting freaks and the dracos. The, the universe would be a better place without them, and uh, probably justifiably so. It would probably be a correct conclusion because they are perfectly possessed, okay? Um, <clears throat> but at the higher realms, okay, I read somewhere in an article, and I I have not been able to find it. I probably have it in uh, my file somewhere, buried deep in my secret uh, files, <laughs> deep underground files, library, is uh, <clears throat> that the ultimate achievement is like the ninth heaven. When you achieve the ninth heaven, you have achieved the full illumination of Lucifer. It's the Lucifer, the spirit of Lucifer. You are at one with Lucifer when you achieve the ninth heaven. Okay, wouldn't that be just a great experience to achieve the ninth heaven and have full illumination and full the full light of Lucifer? Okay, that's what these New Agers aspire to: is is the full light and love and illumination of Lucifer, the Luciferian spirit. Okay, and and they think they if they can achieve that, they have achieved at oneness with the universe. But what they're not Understanding, just like the church is not understanding, is this fallen one third. That this fallen one third is put in a sandbox, and you can't achieve higher realms of illumination, higher heavens. Okay, within this fallen nine realms, within the fallen one third, and you can achieve that ninth level of illumination and become at one with Lucifer. Think of Carolyn Hamlet. That was part of her testimony. It was a time in her life where Lucifer appeared unto her as the real Jesus. And she almost accepted him. But there was something, a check in her spirit, a check in her inner knowing that, no, she backed away from it. She backed away from that invitation. Okay, so praise Jesus she did. I'm saying praise the real Jesus she backed away from that. Somebody must have been praying for her. Okay, so that's how important our prayers are. When we view these people, when these New Agers, and, and even the ones that are famous and are out there in the book circuits and lecture circuits and they're doing movies and everything, pray for them. Okay, keep them in your prayers. That's how important our prayers are. Um, <clears throat> that they, they will come to the real Jesus and forego the false Jesus. Now, how is it that Lucifer could appear as the real Jesus? Okay, because Lucifer once upon a time was before the Godhead. Okay, and as, again, clearly spells that out in Ezekiel chapter 28 up to verse 15, 15b. He was 
until iniquity was found in him. Okay? So up to that point, he was before the Godhead. And he went to and fro, proclaiming the word and will and love and light and law of the Godhead unto the rest of creation. All right? So if he can appear as as the real Jesus, he can probably also appear as the real Heavenly Father, and he can also probably appear as the Holy Spirit. Okay? So it's really an enigma in this fallen one-third reality that we are in, this matrix. Which is it? Is it real or is it memorix? What are we dealing here with? Okay, so... <clears throat> It's all the more crucial to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And in order to do that, then you have to you have to have more than just a Christ consciousness, okay? The New Agers like to say about talk about a Christ consciousness, okay? Now we can understand that from the perspective of obtaining the mind of Christ, but how do you obtain the mind of Christ? It's through having a personal relationship with him. And what did Jesus say? If you love me, you will uh, uh, obey my commandments. Okay, well, what were his commandments? Well, he made it really simple for us to love our Heavenly Father with every ounce of our being and to love our fellow man and woman with every ounce of our being. Okay, so how difficult is that? Jesus took like the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament as well as all the other laws and ordinances and everything that the Father had established during Old Testament and covenant with Israel and and shrunk them down into two easy-to-follow commandments, okay? And yet, how difficult is it? I guess it's really, really difficult for the majority of people to even reach that level where they even appear to be doing that, okay? <clears throat> That's what a grip that sin has on this world that it's very difficult. But then you have some people that have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. So you can acquire a Christ consciousness, but the power is not in you because you do not have a a living, working relationship with Jesus. So you might ascend to a Christ consciousness, and you might say that you know Jesus even, but does Jesus know you? is going to be the ultimate question and the ultimate answer to be answered, is does Jesus know you? And we know that in in the um, story that he told about the ten virgins. There was five that were wise and five that were foolish. And the five foolish were left behind. And when they finally came back and were banging on the door to be let let in, Jesus said, I never knew you. Okay? I never knew you. You weren't here when, when I came, so I don't know you. Okay? So it's gonna there's gonna come a point where it's gonna be too late. Okay? It's gonna be too late. There's gonna be a lot of prodigal sons and daughters. They're gonna find themselves in the pig pen of life and there'll be no way to get back home because the door has closed. Okay? The door has been closed. They believed the lie for too long, whether outside the church or inside the church. You can be in a church and still believe a lie, okay, is what I'm getting at, and not be fully liberated to live directly with a personal working relationship with Jesus, okay? Or you can be outside the church, small c, and have a living, working relationship with Jesus, far more powerful and and living than if you were in a small church somewhere with four walls and a roof and dying every time you go to Sunday Sunday uh, classes and Sunday sermons, you're dying every time you go there, dying another inch, okay, stuck in a pig pen. See, Lucifer slash Satan has created a multitude of pig pens for all of us to enjoy, okay? Whatever your delusion may be, he has a pig pen for you to enjoy, a pig pen of life. You might be in a, sex, a successful Wall Street trader, but you're in a pig pen. You got millions of bucks. You got yachts. You got 
quotes. You've got wine, women, and song. You've got political connections. You might be the president of the United States, but you're living in a pig pen. You might be a successful uh, mega preacher of, of a mega televangelist, having thousands of people in your church and millions watching you worldwide, but you're still in a pig pen. That's how strong this strong delusion is, folks. And there's a lot of other delusions that we like to entertain ourselves with. That if we stay in that pig pen and we don't wake up to our true calling and our true past and where we truly belong to and with in a living, working relationship, we will be lost forever, just like those five foolish virgins lost forever they were judged along with the unrighteous world they used to be they were virgins they were still virgins but they're foolish virgins and they were judged along with the unrighteous okay so picture noah in his time preaching preaching his heart out trying to win the lost for christ in his day and i would bet that there were certain people who heeded his his message? But they were like the foolish virgins. They did not build their own arks. They did not prepare their, their own selves and their own families with provisions to ride out what was coming. They they disregarded the doom and gloom aspect. Maybe they, they tried to their their best and, and from from a humanistic perspective they looked like they were righteous before God. Bottom line, folks, is they did not prepare for the disaster that was about to strike. And so they were washed away in the flood along with the unrighteous. Okay? So if God is telling you to prepare an ark, then you better prepare one. If God is telling you to move, you better move. But you got to do it in God's timing and his will. That means, see, we like to look at some kind of automatic computer program. We just plunk in a few figures and outcomes of solution and we just follow an easy 10-step process and it's it's we would like like it to be that way or go to some fortune teller to tell us our our future okay do you want to go to a fortune teller do you want to read your horoscope or do you want to go to the king and kings and lord of lords and the one who created you to begin with to know what your future is supposed to be i'd rather go to the source you know they say don't monkey around with the, the lower rung uh people go right to the top go to the top person and talk with that person well our top person is jesus himself so why should we go to fortune tellers why should we go to our horoscope and the newspapers and on the internet why should we go to the uh <clears throat> chanters and you know the wall street geniuses to know how to invest our money when we should be going to jesus Maybe Jesus would have you pull out all your money from the stock market because it's going to crash and burn. Maybe you should pull your money out of the 401Ks because the government's going to seize it. And maybe you should donate a, a big chunk of your funds to help the poor. Yeah, those worthless poor, those worthless people on food stamps and government programs, entitlements. You know who the greatest entitlements are is to the fat cats. Big government, big finance, big business, big industry, they're the biggest recipients of government welfare, and yet we point our fingers at the poor single mom and single dad trying to fend for their children as being a bunch of lazy no-gooders when it's really the fat cats at the top that they're lazy no-gooders. <laughs> okay. Jesus said multiple times that the first shall be made last and the last shall be made first. So that poor mom, that poor, poor mom, poor dad trying to take care of their children, their families on the low end of the economic political spectrum, if their lives are in Jesus Christ okay, they're going to be elevated, elevated. they're going to be promoted in God's kingdom. Whereas the fat cat, okay, if the fat cat even makes it into heaven he's going to be on the low realm, the lower rung he's going to have a lot of relearning things <laughs> going back to all kinds of classes, back to 101s on uh, everything. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> things will be, uh, in this realm we live in an upside-down down world, 
upside down, inside out. It's very true because in God's world, things will be set all right when that time comes. So the prayers of a righteous person avails much. much. Don't think that this is a, an ultimate um, hologram where nothing matters. It does matter. And if it didn't matter, you, if you want a reality check, you just go over to your own Bible. And, for example, I'll read you, I wanted to read something really simple here from Zechariah chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. Well, I'll back up here, verse 8. And the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Render true judgments. Show kindness and mercy each to his brother. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor. And let none of you devise evil against his brother in your heart. But what happened? And turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears that they might not hear. So in other words, even in Zechariah's day, God's people here preferred false judgments, preferred um, hatred and no mercy to anybody. They, they preferred to oppress the widow. They preferred to oppress the fatherless. They preferred to oppress the sojourner and the poor. And they were preferred to devise evil they went to bed at night dreaming about the evil they could conduct the next day. That's how bad they were. Well, what has changed today? Do you see anything that's changed today? You see that all over the place. But we also see kindness. Once in a while, a random act of kindness makes the news. And we see where somebody has done something good and morally decent. And praise Jesus for those people. If you want to make an impact in this world, again, first line of offense and defense is on your knees in prayer. And go out there and do something like a random act of kindness for somebody. If you've got a, a spare thousand dollars and you're thinking on taking a trip to the Caribbean, you know, maybe it takes five thousand. I have no idea how much it takes to take a trip to go to the Caribbean, go to the Middle East, to, you know, take this fantastic vacation. Why don't you give that money? Go down to your local water department and find out how many families are in the rears and are being threatened and you know, being evicted from their homes and go pay those overdue bills for them Anonym, anonymously. Just go down there and pay. you got a spare 1000 spare 5 spare 10 If you're somebody who likes to go to Vegas and blow off steam by putting $10,000, $20,000 on the, on the tables and you think you had a wonderful time, take that money and pay somebody else's that's gotten in the rears because of our faltering economy because the next person who's going to be in, in the rears is going to be you, bub. <laughs> okay. So it's time to open up your hearts and to give the poor because the government is not going to do it in the proper context. If they ever do anything correctly, anything righteously, it's only to conceal. If they ever tell the truth about anything, it's only to conceal a greater lie, a greater untruth, a greater hardship, heartbreak. Okay? <clears throat> so you do it. It gets back to why did God create us to be on a shelf somewhere or to be puppets pulled on a string or to be participants in his creation. So if we conclude that we are to be participants in his creation, then get out there and make a difference for somebody. Pay those bills. Stop looking at people that are on welfare. We we know the economy is, is collapsing. A lot of people who want to work can't, either can't find or can't find the kind of work that sustains themselves, let alone a family. So then they're forced to be on these government programs. Get out there and be the person that makes a difference for that person and their family to get them back on their feet. Okay, Get personally involved. So I've been reading... Um, the Syrian, the Syrian stuff, okay? So you better believe that um, part of this strong delusion is when these various beings return to here at Earth and claim that we, uh, like the Syrians, for example, helped uh, create mankind, you know, in his DNA and everything, um, the creator gods, okay? So um, one thing we do know from Scripture is we know about the Genesis 6 problem, okay? Is is that how they mean it? 
how they became our creator gods. They dorked with our DNA. Okay. Um, we know about the Cain problem, um, where the serpent had relations with, with Eve and begot Cain. Okay. <clears throat> so we know how that DNA got dorked with. And we know about after the flood, Noah's flood, um, when the uh, Hebrews came into the promised land, they encountered these giants. So once again, the DNA got dorked with, okay? Our DNA has been assaulted, and it's even assaulted to this day, and yet these Syrians are claiming to be our creators. Okay, so it, I guess it depends on how you look at it, you know? They're claiming to be our creators, but uh, we could make the claim that they've done nothing but dork with our DNA from, from our Heavenly Father's inception of our DNA, of what our DNA was supposed to be. So, one of the strong delusions that you mentioned before, John, is once saved, always saved. Okay, so if that was the case, then Lucifer never has really fallen. He he's still in God's good graces, and he, him and God are are conspiring behind the scenes and everything. Just that w that we mankind are here as a test to see our loyalties, where our loyalties will will end up with. Are we going to go with Lucifer or are we going to go with our Heavenly Father? So it's just a big contest behind the scenes. It's just one big put-on show, okay? And we're just a bunch of puppets on this show, okay? So once saved, always saved. So the reality is that Lucifer was created saved, folks. He was created saved. He wasn't born into sin. He was created saved, created 100%. Okay? And he stayed that way for a long period of time until iniquity was found in him. Okay, So then he fell. So once saved, always saved, does not even apply to him. And he was created perfect. Okay, Now we are born into sin, even if we just look at it from the natural, natural eye perspective of DNA, of, that our DNA has been corrupted over so many generations and thousands of years, even by... In our our time, in our natural world, the assault of chemtrails and other pollutants, and like I said earlier, you know, the radio frequencies, TVs, and Gwen Towers, and Elf Towers, and all this business going on <clears throat> are, are corrupting our DNA. So it's, it's amazing that any of us are still here, <laughs> okay? But that's how resilient the, the air correction codes that God put into our immune systems and our DNA to, to be able to sustain, okay? But there will probably come a tipping point that will be so overloaded in our environment that <clears throat> um, a lot of people are just going to drop dead from, from this. It's just like we're seeing with birds and fish and um, all over the planet that are just dropping dead by the thousands and millions, just dropping dead. At what point does that start happening to us? That one one day we'll wake up to the news that's, that a certain number of people in a certain place on the planet, they all just drop dead. Un totally unexplained, they just all drop dead. <clears throat> Will we finally wake up and realize that, hey, maybe this pig pen we've created for ourselves is not a, a very <clears throat> a very good good reality to be in? <clears throat> okay. And, okay, once saved, always saved. And then there's the strong delusion through the New Age movement called ascension, that we can ascend. Well, certainly we're in this three-dimensional. There's a lot of things that the New Age movement understands and understands very well. And so my first, I knew about the New Age movement like back in the late 70s throughout the 80s, but I never had really talked to anybody who was New Ager <clears throat> until uh, the early 90s. I moved out here where I'm at, and I got involved, interested and involved in the uh, local UFO network group, and a lot of them were New Agers. So that was my first um, uh, up-close personal, and some of them became my friends. And it was amazing to me that a lot of things that they understand and believe in are, are very scriptural. Okay, well, where, where, where ultimately did the New Age get their material? Okay, from we can say, well, from Lucifer. Okay, well, where did Lucifer get it from? <clears throat> from his former position as the high priest of creation his former relationship that he had with the Godhead. He had it, see, the, the longer we spend with Jesus, the more we should be able to reflect his person, his personality, his life, his love to others that we meet every day, right? Isn't that what we aspire to do, to become more like Jesus? So if that's our aspiration, then in reality we should at some point begin reflecting that 
that reality to others, okay, to be Jesus with skin on. Well, imagine Lucifer having absolutely no, um, nothing to impede that process. He was created perfect, and he is 100% before the Godhead. He's absorbing 100% of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit into himself during that whole stretch of time, absorbing it. So is it any wonder then that he can appear as an angel of light? Because that's what he once was, that's what he still is, is the top angel of light. But he's no longer in God's kingdom, okay? He left, he walked away, just like that rich young ruler. But he carried his images with him. He brought his images with him. He brought his understanding and wisdom and the light of God, the love of God, and the Godhead with him to create his new reality as though it's that he's the top banana, okay, as though he's the creator of all creation. He's created a pig pen for himself in reality, and it's a huge pig pen, of course, but he's created his own prison. So this New Age movement ascension, where you leave the third dimension into a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, like the Assyrians coming from the sixth dimension, these Syrians that have ascended from Sirius B star system they ascended into the sixth dimension or something. I'll, I'll get it more into that in the next episode. Okay, well, to me that means that they were obliterated from the third dimension. They used to be in a third dimension reality, but there a war took place, this angel wars, and they became ascended, which means that their third dimension reality got blown away and now they have ascended into a higher reality. Okay, within Lucifer's nine heavens, they probably did ascend into a higher reality, higher vibratory reality, okay? But it's not heaven, folks. It's still within Lucifer's domain of his nine uh, heavens, so to speak, okay? So maybe with enough time and effort that these Syrians on the sixth dimension can ascend up ultimately to the ninth dimension, and be totally at one with Lucifer. Wouldn't that be just wonderful? <laughs> uh, not in my mind, folks. <clears throat> See, they're, they're deluded. They're not telling you about this in the church because they don't understand what happened eons ago. They can't tell you these truths. So the New Agers won't tell you because maybe a lot of them don't know either because Lucifer is not about to tell them the truth about these nine heavens and the pig pen that he's in, he's not going to tell anybody the truth about that. And the death sentence, the death row that he's on, portray himself as a god of light and love, and he's always been there for mankind, to promote mankind, and to be a blessing to mankind. And it's that god over there that the Christians serve is, is, the, is the Satan character. That's how he portrays it. <clears throat> okay, so... <clears throat> when God... You know, he stretched out the heavens. I covered this before. That implies space and time. Okay, and within this fallen one-third, we can relate that there's nine nine uh, dimensions of of Lucifer, nine ascensions, uh, and they had become corrupted. So nine heavens of the Mayas, nine stones of Lucifer's breastplate, the council of the nine of the top, nine uh, angelics that are directly answerable to Lucifer, uh, that's nine tribes of angels, that each of these members of the Council of Nine had a tribe of a angelics underneath of them, and then it's like a pyramid, you know, uh, going down for each one of them. And the, the highest levels of these nine heavens, the highest level nine, you reach true and full Luciferian illumination and being at one with Lucifer. <clears throat> but even at this ninth level, if you are one of those people that have achieved true and full Luciferian illumination, what you are witnessing, what you are experiencing, is the highest order, the highest heaven, the highest reality, but within the fallen one-third. Do you see what I'm saying, folks? We have to get beyond this ninth heaven reality of Lucifer and get into our Heavenly Father's reality side of things. We have to get through this illusion. We have to get through this holographic, what, what the enemy would like us 
try to convince us that, that this pig pen we're living in is some kind of wonderful existence. <clears throat> Thank God the prodigal son woke up. Thank God he remembered who he used to be. Thank God he humbled himself. He humbled himself. He, he didn't return to his father with arrogance, not one ounce of arrogance or supposition of who he used to be and what he should be entitled to as, a, as his father's son. He came with true humility. He said, if, if I'm nothing more than a, a lowly servant unto my father, I'm better off than being in this pig pen. We can't come to our Heavenly Father with arrogance and with ultimately with sin in our life. We have to come with true humility and circumcision of our hearts and have our sins washed away by the blood of Jesus or we cannot come back to our Heavenly Father. And we cannot come back even to be a lowly servant, let alone restored as a full son with full honors and position of sonship and inheritance. There's a difference differences between, and I'll get this next time because we're getting up close to the hour, of slave, servant, and sonship. And I'll cover that in a probably the next episode. So we, ultimately we want to get back to our true son and daughtership with our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ and not accept this um, highest order of Luciferian illumination business because it's not a true light, not a true love, not a true reality. It's still in the pig pen. It's still in the sandbox that God put all this in. Okay, I hope that makes sense, sense folks. And we'll <clears throat> we'll dig, <laughs> you know, getting into the Sir- Syrian stuff. We will get there, but I wanted to cover some of these these bases first because there's a lot of stuff going on in the world today that captures our attention, and we have to, if we're going to stay truly connected with Jesus, we have to be able to dis- rightly divide and discern what's in the pig pen and what's truly of our Heavenly Father kind of thing. I hope that makes sense. <clears throat> um, and go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, we're down to 1 minute, 19 seconds, 17 seconds, 16 okay. seconds. Praise Jesus! So we're, yeah. we're just about down to the end of the reel. The the reel to reel is just about to run off and go... <laughs> Praise yeah. God. But anyway, um, uh, so again, folks, this was Peterson Chronicles, Angel Wars and the Luciferian Rebellion, show number 54. And Lord willing, God bless you all. We will see you next Saturday night. Praise Jesus. God bless you, Brother Lauren. Take care. Until next week.